Hi guys, and welcome to another episode of the Stephen Gillen Crime Files. My next guest has a fascinating story. It could be said that if his story was put in front of a Hollywood scriptwriter as a first draft, it would be dismissed as unbelievable, really. You know, we're talking about someone who was black ops, really, you know, was in between the CIA and the FBI for many years, undercover in the mafia, the Italian mafia, and later to go on to um, into the Russian mafia and be aligned with some unbelievable figures of the day. But the plot doesn't stop there. It thickens greatly with this next unbelievable guest because his father was actually a made man and a carpo in the mafia. And he grew up amongst this life. This is an unbelievable reveal, guys. Coming next. Stephen Gillen Crime Files, together with other true crime and other noted content, including documentaries and very current elevated films, are now currently migrating worldwide on main TV platforms. Thank you for joining into another episode. Today will not disappoint. Today I've got an unbelievable person with an unbelievable journey. We're going to go behind the curtain but not just behind what was very, very key organized crime in the USA, but both sides of the fence. And we're going to go deep and we have a real expert. Today, my uh, special guest is Ronald Fino. Thanks for coming on the platform. Man. Oh, thank you, Stephen, for having me. Now, for people who don't know you, Ron, you really have an exceptional story. I've interviewed many high-level current mobsters of the day. But yours really is unique in the sense you lived that life, saw through the life early, was undercover for so many years, had a father who was a carpo, but then went on to be a very noted CIA agent, FBI agent, and to go on, you know, really international undercover to, to do unbelievable things. How did it start for you, this journey? Well, it started, first of all, my father actually became the acting boss of the uh, what we refer to as the Magadino family of uh, Buffalo, New York. Uh, and uh, as a result, uh, a lot of things were being showered upon me. In fact, even a union position was showered upon me. The problem I always had was the mob. I didn't like the mafia. And, but I didn't want to ever do anything against my father. I didn't like the way they would just knock people to the ground, knock people aside. This is our job, not their job. Screw them, things of that nature. And what happened one time is I'm playing tennis with this Ron Hedinger of the FBI. And I was very critical of the FBI for not doing anything. And he said, Ron, well, if people like you would help, Maybe we could do something. And I says, I'll help. The only thing is two things. I don't want to go against anything against my father, number one, or my family. And 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 number two, I can't afford the surface. And they agreed to that. And, of course, they never did. In fact, they never asked me a question about my father or my family. Uh, and as a result, we I, I specialized for the Bureau and labor racketeering because that was my background as a union official, workers' rights, things like that. And I was watching the union members get ripped off, and I just couldn't take it. One time I had a Polish immigrant worker come up to the union hall and say and he ended up getting down on his hands and knees, and he said, Ron, I can't even get a dress for my daughter's graduation. 
what am I supposed to do? And he's crying. I go into the union hall, and in those days, they would have work slips. And I says to the secretary, what jobs do we have? And he says, well, this one's for this guy, but they were all connections to the mob. And this, one. I says, give me the slip. I take the slip. I go out and give it to the worker. Well, later in the day, the wise guys came in. That's what we re would refer to them as. And they told me, what the hell are you doing? That job was supposed to go to so-and-so's nephew. That's, you know, because they were no-show jobs. In other words, they would go there, but they didn't have to work. And you give it away, who the hell do you think you are? I said, well, you got to remember, it's their union. It's their union. No, it's our union. And, of course, they push, you know, and here, believe me, I would have liked to take them out right then and there. But you, know, you realize you can't. Number one, there's too many of them. Number two, you're automatically going to go into the wrong. So, as a result... I would just pass the information on to what I thought was the best source in those days, the FBI. And we started building cases, at which eventually uh, led to these people eventually losing their job, at least temporarily. A lot of them are back in their jobs today. It doesn't go well, away. Let's come in there. Let's come in there, Ron Ryan, because for a lot of viewers, now I've interviewed a lot of the main mob guys of the day. And we're going to talk about them. People like Sammy the Bull, Gravano, John Gotti, John A. Light, all of these guys. And you knew them all, right? Now, we're well, going to I knew some them. of them, you know. I mean, uh, yeah. I, yeah, I knew. I, I never met Gotti. Uh, he's approached me at times, the kid. Yeah, and, but we're going to go there. We're going to go there after, Ron. You know, I just want to go back, right? Yeah. And because for the, for the, for the viewers, what I'm trying to say is, having interviewed a lot of these guys, and I know a lot of the viewers will be thinking, where your father was such a senior member in the mafia, and you, you know, everything you knew from from formative years growing up would have been instructions or what you would have seen living this life around you. What was the conflict and what was the point that you – turned against what really you was brought up with. What made you do that? What was the drive for that? I, I, I can't pinpoint any one area, except I didn't like the abuse that people were getting, that they would use people and then cast them aside and say, screw them. You know, they're, they're not part of my family. I don't care what they can live or die. That bothered me. So I had a conscience problem. Yeah, I get that. So um, what was that inner conflict like? You know, you touched on it earlier then with your own family and your own father. How did you, what was the beginning of you hiding your true feelings, Ronald? From the well, world? first of all, I used to sound off, but I found I couldn't break through because of the strength of these people. I just couldn't break through them. They would tell me, you sit down and keep your mouth shut. That I didn't appreciate because, I mean, let's face it, you're looking after the little guy. It's the little person, the little guy or gal that comes to mind all the time. And, and how do you sleep at night? That's what bothered me. It was, you know, it was eating at my conscience. I could have been a multimillionaire over and over and over again. I would have come up with a, such grandiose schemes that everybody would have made a fortune. But I couldn't do that. It just isn't in my psyche. Yeah. So what was your father like? What was he like as a person? Oh, I love my father. He was a good man. He cared about people, even though he was in the mob. And uh, I mean, there were a lot of mobsters that said the same thing to me. I mean, there was one guy, Freddie Rondaccio, who was uh, in jail that came out and, and he knew I was having problems. Uh, and he says, you know, Ronnie, this life was never for you. I didn't want to see you get involved. And he was right. He was. It wasn't for me. I was of a different kind. I grew up poorly. My father was in jail. My mother had to go shovel snow with me. One time we were shoveling snow, and uh, the, uh, the owner of the house came out, this woman, and she wanted to help me. And I called my, my mother George, my brother. I didn't want her to see it was my mother helping me shovel snow. And that's how we made a living in the wintertime. We were broke. My father was in jail. And it, so I grew up on the streets. I did grow up tough. I was a tough guy, but not that tough. 
Yeah, yeah you, you, was born, like, you was born in New York in uh, 46, yeah, 1946. Yeah, so you know, when you look at that, when you look at that era, it's not too long, really, after Prohibition. It is, but it's a blink of an eye, really, when you look at the 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 kind of emergent development of organized crime. You know, and I say that in the sense that a lot of the old school guys who would have been known as the old school guys, Albert Anastasia, all these kind of guys, these old, Mia Lansky, uh, Lucky Luciano, Charles Luciano, of a certain breed, a certain type, yeah. them rules was very steadfast in them days. That's fair to say. I'm just yes. painting the picture of the times, you know? Yes, it was. Yes. No, it was. They followed the old school. Magadino was old school. He was connected to the Genovese family for many years. They were all connected. He was actually one of the more powerful members of the, the, the La Cosa Nostra and had a lot of say so on the commission. And, you know, I ended up meeting a lot of these people. Some, I, of course, I don't remember, like Joe Colombo I met. He was at our house. Uh, I met, uh, you know, like a Cardo out of Chicago. I knew personally very well. And I would meet with him on a number of occasions. I never met Gotti or the Chin, but I met a lot of the Genovese family. And there are uh, Capos and various people. And John Riggi, of course, of the De Cavacante family that supposedly they made the, uh, the Sopranos on. I knew very well. And it you know, was my testimony that uh, probably convicted him. So I got to know a lot of them. And, and they weren't all bad, you know. I mean, John Riggie was always a gentleman with me, and I didn't like having to testify against him because he was a gentleman with me. Uh, but there were those nasty ones. Those there, there were those Joe Pesci type that you know, so-called screw you. You know, don't ever screw with me. And one guy even told me, "Do you think those are only stories about people with concrete boots in the East River?" Yes. <laughs> so I, you know, I dealt a lot with New York City and. Cleveland, I knew them all. Uh, Las Vegas, you go on and on. You know, I, I knew most of them. So, you know, now, you was undercover. It's fair to say you saw through the life. I mean, many people now in the current era are seeing through the life, but, you know, at the other end. I think it's fair to say you definitely saw through this life a lot earlier than most. Now, you was undercover for 17 years. So... But um, so what? You was a mob associate at that time, all the way through, Ron, right? Yeah, so I, was, I was actually undercover probably for thirty years. Yeah, but with the yeah. Italians, uh, seventeen, right? My no, no, let's say so that they, some sixty, uh, seventy-three, eighty-three. Yeah, about seventeen years. You're correct. And then about, you went to Russia, you know, and yeah, that's yeah. a whole new thing, guys. You know, we're talking yeah. about Russia, we're talking. A lot of stuff. We're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. Yeah. Look, what kind of, you're a mob associate, you know, your father's a senior member, we know that. What kind of jobs was you doing on the way through? Well, what when I mean? first started out, initial, what I initiated, what I mean by that, and into the construction industry, I worked as a common laborer. And I worked with the workers that I had to do regular work. But then all of a sudden, I noticed everybody treating me differently because my father was elevated to the acting uh, uh, boss of the Macadino family. And I didn't appreciate that. I don't need that kind of, uh, I don't have that kind of ego. Let's put it that way. I, did, I didn't appreciate that. And I was eventually brought into the union by this Victor Rendaccio, who uh, I had many arguments with and later became friends with. He said the reason he brought me in is I had a choice between you and Danny Sanzanese, this other wise guy, and I figured I'd choose the smart one. And uh, <laughs> and that, that that I consider myself smart, but anyway, that's what he said. And later on, uh, we talked about it after I started running the complications. He said the same thing his brother had said, Ronnie, this was no life for you. You know, this was never now, now I know, I know, Ronald, you know, in later years after that, you you... You know, you give evidence before Congress, you know, about the labor unions, them rackets, all that kind of stuff. It went all the way up to the top. But yeah. for people out there who don't really understand about how this kind of power sh sharing, kind of leveraging agreement between the labor unions and the rackets and the mafia, they, they don't quite know how that works. Tell us how that worked back in the day. 
Well, first of all, you control politics. We had the money. We would use the benefit funds to filter out money to various politicians. We'd use the union dues for contributions. We had what they call PAC funds. That's political action committee funds that would be used to put our politicians in, in position to be elected and at least help them to, and then go out and uh, do what's necessary to help get them elected. So they had control of the political arena. To some degree, they still do today. It, it was, you know, it was very beneficial, judge appointments, things of that nature. I've seen judges uh, that were uh, mob connected. I've seen political leaders, presidents mob connected. I've seen uh, it work across the border, the border even into Canada, uh, where they had a lot of uh, connections. And, and, you know, I knew the mob up there in Toronto and uh, Montreal and places like that. So it was, it was very big. The second thing, of course, is you control, you're controlling a lot with the stock market. You know, for example, with us, we had millions upon millions back then. Today, it's a lot, lot more of dollars that if uh, we wanted to make money or individuals wanted to make money for other mobsters, what they would do is uh, they would find a penny stock or any given stock and they would tell the people, go buy this stock or buy this this you know, into this company. Next uh, week later, the union benefit funds would pump millions upon millions of dollars into that company. Of course, the stock rises. They then would tell their relatives or the people that invested in, all right, time to get out. And then they would, you know, the stock would eventually start going back down again. <laughs> that was just one of them. There was a myriad of schemes. There yeah, was so... You know, insider dealing and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. But even, uh, you know, it even translates, doesn't it, Ronald, down to, you know, a normal, medium kind of small business where they can have their trucks parked, where they can where they can take the, the you know, the merchandise, how long they can be there, who comes first, who comes last, of course. you know, who gets protection, as it were, and their stuff don't go west and all that stuff, doesn't it? Yes, I mean not only that; it's the ships, the ships that would come. The ship, you know, as far as you want, you want to get your ship unloaded, you would need the mob, especially in the ports of uh, Newark and, and New York City and some of the other ports. They would be the ones that would decide which ones get unloaded, and if you weren't connected, you, your ship had to wait. Uh, the same with textile uh, materials, anything. I mean, they controlled everything: the garbage business, who got their garbage picked up. Well, how do you, do you know who made money and, and the prices they would charge? I mean, it was astronomical. It's it, there was everything when it, at those days, New York City, can, the mob controlled everything. Boxing, yeah, you know, I knew all these people. I met with Carbone and all these people. One time, I was at the Madison Square Garden. My father sat with Carbone and a few other people. I was put on the other side with Carmen Basilio and my uncle. And uh, Carmen Basile was an ex uh, welterweight, Wilter, welterweight champion of the world. And we had to sit on the, because we couldn't sit with them. But with, I mean, you know, with all these fights were rigged. When I grew up, uh, when I, my father was in jail, the manager of Joe Lewis took me in, the famous heavyweight champion. And he would take after me. Now, he was a great guy, as far as I'm concerned, Marshall Miles, uh, black fellow, but he controlled. The, the the numbers racket in Western New York. And he made us, but, but we're, you know, we had a great relationship. He was a nice guy. He took me for my first steak. <laughs> so look, it is a question. It is a question. I mean, in them days, you know, for many years, it was fair to, fair to say that all that monopolization was controlled by threats and murder, Ronald, right? Yeah. Yes, yes. Now, it's interesting because... Intimidation. Of our, uh, intimidation. Yeah, intimidation, uh, threats, um, you know, to violence, murder, you know, yes. or worse, right? So yeah. it's interesting because we're going to cover this about how the mafia has pivoted now, organized crime around the world. I know you're an expert, right? You know, and it's certainly changed in the, in the, in the latter day. So what was it really like Having a father like you did, being in the center of a family that you was, but having to hide your true feelings and then 
give all the information to the government. I mean, how did they make the approach to you first? What was the, what was that about, Ronald? How well, did they do that? I was playing tennis one time, and an FBI agent was playing across from me, and uh, I was actually upset with them for not doing enough on the labor's union and, and the corruption in the union. And he goes to me, Ron, if someone like you would help, maybe we could get something done. I says, I'll be more than happy to help. The only thing is, don't ask me about my father. Don't ask me about my family. And I really don't want to uh, surface because I, I, it would be devastating once you surface because now you got to live a life on the run. And he agreed to it. And he was a good man. He, he remained a friend. I don't know if he's still alive, this Ron Hedinger. But we were close for a lot of years. And I stayed with the Bureau ever since then. Now, earlier than that, I was approached by the CIA a few years before that. That dealt with a different area, though. That was over somebody that was involved in arms smuggling up in Toronto. And uh, they, they, they had a CIA site in Buffalo that was raided uh, by a student's group. And this guy happened to be one of the ones that was involved that I found out that uh, he was incoherent. He was so drugged up, he didn't know what was up or down. The only thing he said, everybody's following me. I'm being followed. He was paranoid, <laughs> which he probably was being followed. But uh, yeah, that, that's how I got my start. So the CIA, they approached you first. What was their approach like? See, I was thinking maybe they, you know, they knew who he was. He was undercover, so they thought we'll make an approach. You know, this guy's, you know, conducive to. We can talk to him or whatever. Maybe, right? You know, we'll make yeah. an approach. Yeah, I, I, I think what approach, happened. Like the CIA. Yeah, what what I put happened there was a roommate of mine who was killed in a fire, uh, an explosion. This Tony Waskalevich told uh, this Al Alphonse Hartle who was a, he was an old OSS officer. He worked with Averill Harriman for many, many years. And he was assigned to the Western New York office. By this time, he was out of the CIA. He was working for the Justice Department. And he was the one that approached me. And he was a very nice gentleman. He was a very nice gentleman. And he told me, Ronnie, I know you're, you're, you're an American. You're a main person. Maybe you can help us on some of these things. And I said, no, of course, I'd be more than willing to help you on it. And we became long friends until his death. And as I knew his wife, Francis, I knew that the family, his family still close to me. He was a wonderful man. And uh, you know, that's what got me started, you know, working on uh, what was happening with the, the break into the, uh, satellite, or the CIA satellite office. Now, I know, you know, in later years, you've even gone on, you know, to be very, very close with the, uh, with the Putin administration, just to, just to slightly say some names in there and not go too far. But so with the CIA and the FBI, how did that relationship develop? Whether they start paying you or? What was no, 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 no. I, I never took money in the beginning. No, how it developed, the CIA and FBI never got along. The, neither side liked me dealing with the other side. They were very leery. How it came about that I ended up really helping the FBI is the FBI was watching Local 210. They were monitoring. That's the union I was with. And there was a, a, a bum, a, a street bum. Uh, was While they were watching, they got out of the car to get license plate numbers. And the street bump goes in and takes the one FBI agent's briefcase, weapon, everything you can think of, all the what we referred to in those days as pink sheets, the 95 dash numbers, those are the FBI numbers. Uh, then he came into the union hall and he wanted to see me. He wanted a job. And he says, I have something that'll guarantee me a job. And I says, What's that? And he starts showing me some of these FBI paraphernalia, you know. I didn't want him showing everything. I says, here's what you do. My car is out in the driveway. Uh, go put everything by the right rear tire in the briefcase. And you come back on Monday. It was a Friday, I believe it was. And you come back on Monday, and I'll have a job for you. So, so no sooner did I start going through this stuff, 
the mob walks in. I had the mafia people looking. What's that guy want? And I had to show him something. The rest I stuffed in my drawer, but I showed him he had this. And uh, Ronnie, this is a setup. This is a setup. They would never have let this stuff out of their hands. Mm. You know, they're saying. So I says, well, here's what I'll do. I'll take it to the union attorney. I'll let them see it. In the meantime, I called over to the Justice Department, Al Hartle at that time. I was looking for Al. Al was not in. So uh, I go up to the Justice Department's office and I explain to him, this is what I have. Now we have to move and do something right here. Uh, they sent an the, the, uh, FBI agent over to see me and I explained to him what happened. Now I had the, by this time I had the briefcase with me and I says they don't know about the briefcase so I turned that over but I said they know about these documents and I'm supposed to take them over to the attorney so if I don't take these over to the attorney I have a problem so they said okay you do that uh, then, then what we're going to do is we'll, we'll uh, you know, but they weren't all there some of the documents were missing mm. this one of the mobsters took the documents <clears throat> so I ended up uh, going through the attorney through the motions and uh, they said, no, you can't have, hold this stuff. This is, you know, this is owned by the government or you can't, you know, hold this information. But now I had to meet with the Bureau. So Ron, uh, uh, a friend of mine uh, came over and uh, I told him, meet me over here. I'm backing up a driveway. I almost killed the poor guy. <laughs> I'm backing up a, a, a dead end alley. And uh, I, he spilled his coffee all over himself. And... Uh, I says, we got to make a plan here because I have a problem. If they start wondering and they get this bum and found out what happened to the rest of the briefcase, I have a problem. So we're going to have to cover it. Well, I decided to, to put a bug in the union hall because they weren't doing anything. I planted one myself in the ceiling, uh, an FM radio receiver, something like that. I put in there just to cover for myself because I'm not getting any help on the deal. Yeah, I mean, on the back of that there, Ron, what was it like living this double life for so long? Because it has to be said, you know, mob guys, you know, it's life and death for them. They're very insightful for that kind of thing. They're even watching for the for the, for the the treachery, right? This is how they live. And, of course, if you get found doing something like that, there's only one thing that's going to happen. Death and probably torture, even worse, right? Well, what happened to me? It happened to me. One time I'm driving around with an FBI agent, this Jack Porstel, and and, uh, and I was spotted by two mobsters. They were across the street, and they seen me driving around with them. Word went out to the boss of the family at that time, Sammy Frenchamore, and uh, they said that we seen Ronnie with an FBI agent. So. Uh -huh. I had to go out to the farm. That was his place. It was called the farm. It was a little distance from Buffalo. And I had to tell him that this is what happened, Sammy. I'm in front of the union hall, these FBI agents. I said it was two because FBI agents aren't going to pick up somebody unless there's two possibly. No one agent normally picks somebody up. So I said there were two, hoping that they didn't look and see if there was somebody in the back seat or anything. And I says, this is what happened. And I says, he picks me up, get in the car, Ronnie. We know you're a good kid. We know that you've always been doing the right thing. Now you can do the right thing. We want you to cooperate with us. You can help us. We know how you feel. And, I, and I'm telling this to the boss of the family. And I said, I told, the, I, I told him, I said that, I told the FBI, listen, just let me go. I want to go back to my job. And, or if you're going to arrest me, arrest me. But otherwise, just drop me off. And that's how it ended. And, uh, of course, he, he obviously accepted it because I'm still here. Yeah. I mean, was you, you know, was you ever trained then? You know, I mean, you learned yourself these skills, you know, these skills of disguise, of sleight of hand, of being a chameleon or, or you know, at the cutting edge. But well, did these guys, the CIA and the FBI, did they give you any training? For this no. Program?